Good morning and welcome. Uh, I'm going to call this meeting of the Summer Flounder, Scup, and Black Sea Bass Management Board to order. My name is Bob Ballou. I have the honor of serving as board chair. I'd like to start out by welcoming two new members uh, to the board, uh, Phil Langley from the state of Maryland, welcome, and uh, Jerry Mannon from the state of North Carolina, welcome. Uh, Having dispensed with item one on the agenda, we're on to item two, which is the agenda itself. Uh, before I ask uh, whether any members of the board have any requested changes, I do have one, and that is a brief report out on the outcomes of the three board votes done via polling on the two conservation equivalency proposals for recreational flukes submitted by Rhode Island and New Jersey, and the Virginia proposal for accounting for recreational black sea bass harvest during their February fishery. Is there any objection to adding that brief update? Seeing none, we'll uh, add that between items three and four. And then also under other business, I'd like to briefly address agenda items for our next board meeting in August. In particular, a suggestion for a focused discussion on discard mortality in the recreational black sea bass fishery. Are there any other uh, recommended changes to, or modifications to the agenda? Tom Fody? It's not a change or modification, but I wanted to say uh, just a few words. If I put Jersey Coast newsletters back there because I wrote an article on Summer Flounder, and I basically commented on how what a great job NIMS actually did with handling the MRAP numbers. They don't get credit for what they did, but they did the job right by expanding the, um, the numbers out and basically reevaluating what the stock was instead of just saying we were overfished and overfishing take place. So I really want to make sure I thank them for doing that. But the, the bad part of it was that if you accepted those numbers, which I thought the commercial fishery should have got the 49 percent increase, and you tell me you're accepting those numbers to increase by 49 percent, and we've been under for the last five years and up the last three years, 15 percent, they could have given us the three and a half percent. I know the shutdown came and stopped a lot of the paperwork, but that's this is not sitting well with the recreational community. They understand why the, the, tr the 49 percent was put there. But if you're trusting the numbers to give a 49 percent increase and can't do a three and a half percent increase on us based on the 50, 15 percent that we've been under for the last three years, it doesn't sound good. Thank you for that. Are there any other recommended changes to the agenda? Seeing none, is there any, any objection to approving the agenda as modified? Seeing none, the agenda as modified stands approved by consent, and we're on to item three, which is public comment. No one has signed up, but is there anyone here from the public who would like to address the board on any issue that is not on today's agenda? Seeing no hands, uh, we, are, we are on to the next item, and that is the item that I asked to be added, and that is just a brief report out on the uh, votes taken by the board on the three issues, and I believe Kirby has a quick update on that. Kirby? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So as uh, Bob noted, there was an email vote regarding a conservation equivalency on summer flounder for Rhode Island, for New Jersey, and then for Virginia regarding black sea bass. So Rhode Island had proposed to have a shore site um, for summer flounder, allowing anglers to harvest fish at a 17-inch minimum size and a two-fish bag limit that is in addition to their current 19-inch uh, size limit, and the state has a six-fish bag limit. So in total, uh, anglers can harvest up to six fish from those sites. Four of them may be at 19 inches, two have to be at 17 inches. For New Jersey, they propose to adjust their season by one day on either end of the start and end. So their new season for 20. Um, 19 is a start day of May 24th and an end date of September 21st. Regarding Virginia, the change in their black sea bass measures is specific to their season, accounting for the February fishery that took place this year. So they had a February fishery that lasted from February 1st to February 28th. They now have a uh, opening in May for two weeks, starting May 15th through uh, May 31st, and then opening again from June 22nd through December 31st. So with that, I'll take any questions, but as noted earlier, uh, these proposals were approved without objection. Thank you. Any questions for Kirby? Seeing none, we're on to item four, which is a review of the planned development team, a.k.a. PDT, analysis of the Black Sea Bass commercial management strategies to address fishery shifts. 
Our meeting materials include two reports, one from the PDT, the other from the joint advisory panel meeting held to review that PDT report. So our plan today, this is really the heart of the uh, agenda. We'll be spending the majority of today's meeting on this agenda item. Um, and our plan is to first have Caitlin provide a presentation on both reports, and that will be followed by board review and discussion. So with that, Caitlin, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And actually, before I get into the PDT report, the board chair had asked me to quickly go over the items that this board has on its plate and has recently um, dispensed with. So I'm going to do that really quickly um, just to make sure everyone's on the same page with where we are today. So some of the recent actions this board has taken included um, the board and council jointly recommending approval of the summer flounder amendment at the joint meeting in March and the um, board and council approving addendum 31 in December and the board approving addendum 32 in December as well. And then as for ongoing activities and actions this board is looking at, again, um, the summer flounder amendment will be considered for final approval by the business section today. So I just wanted to note that. And then Black Sea Bass Commercial Management has um, been ongoing through the PDT's work. So we will review today the PDT's report and uh, have a possible action on that item. Black Sea Bass Recreational Reform is also continuing work through a working group um, jointly with the council and as well. And meetings on that will likely occur over this summer. And then lastly, for the Black Sea Bass and SCUP operational assessments, we're scheduled to have those available for board review in October 2019. So just wanted to quickly lay out the field for us before getting into the PDT report. And if there's any questions on that, I can take them. Any questions for Caitlin on that review? Seeing none, why don't we move on to the next agenda item? Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so again, I'll be going over the plan development team's report and going over the work that they've done in the last couple of months on additional analyses of potential approaches for Black Sea Bass commercial management. So I'll start out with some background information, then review the problem statement that the Black Sea Bass commercial working group presented at the last meeting in February, then go over the analysis that the PDT has put together on these potential management strategies that are related to commercial state-by-state -state allocations, and and those include the TMGC approach, a trigger approach, a quota auction approach, and some hybrid approaches. And then I'll present some of the general decision points that the PDT um, identified for these approaches and wrap up with next steps for the board and take questions. So in August 2018, the board established a commercial working group in response to a board motion last May to identify actions that would address changes in black sea bass abundance and distribution. And the purpose of the working group was specifically to identify issues in commercial um, black sea bass fishery related to these changes and brainstorm some ideas for management that could address those issues. The working group presented their report in February, and after that point, the board established the plan development team to continue fleshing out and analyzing the proposed management strategies that the working group identified, as well as a few others put forward by board members. And after that PDT was formed in February, the board met jointly with the Mid-Atlantic Council in March to discuss this work um, on commercial issues that had been done at the board. And at that meeting, the council initiated an amendment to address commercial issues, namely allocation and other related issues. And the action taken by the council at that meeting was mostly procedural at this point, um, as it will allow them to direct some of their staff resources towards supporting and contributing to the board's ongoing work and allow the council and board to coordinate on the development of options that would require council involvement. So as a result, the council staff has participated on the PDT and will continue to do so as their work continues. And we also held a joint advisory panel meeting at the beginning of April to get feedback from the advisors of both bodies on the, the approaches that have been discussed by the PDT. So that leads us to, to, to today where the board will consider the PDT's report as well as, as the AP's feedback and determine the best path forward for commercial management issues. So before getting into the PDT's work, I just want to quickly review the commercial issues that the working group identified and the board supported in February. And the first of those issues was that the commercial state allocations, which were set back in 2003 under Amendment 13, are not reflective of the current distribution of the resource. 
These allocations were loosely based on landings for the period from 1980 to 2001, and they resulted in 33% of the quota being distributed between the states of Maine to New York and 67% between New Jersey and North Carolina. And the working group noted that these allocations have remained unchanged, um, though there have been sub substantial changes observed in the distribution of the stock over the past 15 years. And those changes are shown by this figure, which is derived from the last stock assessment. And it shows the spawning stock biomass estimates for north and south of Hudson Canyon. SSB in the southern region is shown by the blue line, and the orange line shows SSB in the northern region. And around 2007, you can see that orange line increases rapidly, while the blue line also increases, but to a lesser extent. And as of 2015, the majority of the spawning stock biomass is occurring north of Hudson Canyon. Um, the open circles at the end of the time series there represent the retro-adjusted regional values that were peer-reviewed in late 2016, early 2017, and that have been used for management and projections since then. So the second issue that the working group identified was related to the coastwide quota management by NOAA fisheries, which can create um, a, the possibility for the fishery to be closed as soon as uh, the coastwide quota is exceeded, and that could potentially leave states who have not harvested their full quota without the ability to do that. So at the joint meeting in March um, with the council, the board and council did discuss this issue and um, noted that it could be addressed in collaboration with the council and NOAA Fisheries. So the PDT did not focus on this issue. And instead, the PDT focused on that first issue of commercial state-by-state -state allocations, and they specifically focused on the management strategies that were proposed in the working group report and those that were offered up um, at, in February by board members. And those options are listed on this slide. So first is status quo, which is, of course, um, an option the board can consider. And the next three approaches that have been proposed are a change from the current state allocation system. So the first of those is the dynamic approach referred to as TMGC, which gradually shifts allocations over time um, based on a combination of historical landings information and current biomass distribution information. Second is a trigger-based allocation approach, similar to that which was recently adopted for summer flounder. Third is a quota auction approach, or um, ASQ. And fourth is the option of combining approaches to create a hi hybrid approach. And in addition to those, the board could also consider establishing a timeline or a trigger for reevaluating allocations on a regular basis. But this was not something that the PDT discussed. So what is circled in red here is what the TD PDT focused on and what I'll be going over in the next slides. So first is the TMGC approach. And again, this approach was put forward by the working group as a potential strategy for phasing in a new dynamic approach to allocation setting for the black sea bass fishery. And it was modeled after the TMGC approach, which was originally used to adjust allocations for shared George's Bank resources between the United States and Canada. And essentially, the strategy uses a formula to gradually adjust state by state allocations by transitioning from allocations that are based mostly on resource utilization or historic landings, um, and then over time shifting those allocations to be based more on regional resource distribution or biomass information. So in the first years of implementation of this strategy, the historic landings or the current allocations would be the most important part in the formula, and then gradually over time that would shift so that the distribution of the stock is more important in determining allocations for the states. And the equation that establishes the gradual transition is pretty flexible in how it can be set up, and also because the current biomass distribution is what eventually becomes the most important factor in determining allocations, um, this equation can result in allocations that fluctuate in either direction. So it does allow for quota to move back and forth between areas rather than it from one area to another. And the last thing I'll say about this before showing some examples is that the strategy also has the option to establish a control rule so that in any year, um, the total allocation given to a region could not change by more than an established amount, and that can add some stability to this process as well. So to give you an idea of the flexibility in this approach, 
These are the dials that can be adjusted within that formula to determine how allocations would change over time. So for one, you can change the way the resource utilization and distribution information are weighted in that equation. So for example, you could start out setting it at 90% utilization, 10% distribution and um, at the beginning and then at the end have that transition to 10% utilization versus 90% um, distribution at the end. And that can be modified so you can use um, different percentages if you would like. And you can also increase or decrease the transition speed. So how frequently um, adjustments are made to allocations. They could either be set at annual or biannual adjustments. Um, the total time that it takes for that transition to occur can also be altered so that you either have a longer or shorter time frame over which that transition occurs. Um, the state allocations that you start out with for the resource utilization information can also be altered. Um, they could either be set at status quo or they could be changed to accommodate different objectives. For example, maybe adjusting the state's uh, quotas that are deemed inequitable or disproportionate to their current resource availability. Um, for example, the working group did note in their report that Connecticut and New York have disproportionately low um, quotas compared to what their resource availability is now. Um, and then lastly, there is that control rule again that can be adjusted to restrict the maximum amount that the allocations can change each time they're adjusted. So this is a visual aid to show how the different types of information in the allocation formula are applied over time. So as I mentioned, you start out with the historic resource utilization or the current allocations being the larger contributor to the resulting allocations. And the weighted importance of that historic information is shown here in blue. And then in red, you have the importance of the resource distribution information or the regional biomass um, information. So what you see happening over time in this example is that each year or however frequently you're setting those adjustments to occur, the percent contribution of the historic information decreases as the percent contribution of the resource distribution information increases. So eventually you get to a point where the allocations that are being produced by the equation are mostly being influenced, influenced by the resource distribution rather than the historic information. And in this example, the ending weights are set at 90% resource distribution and 10% historic landings. But again, those proportions could be modified to something like 70-30. And this is an example of how the actual allocations would shift over time if you were to apply the weights that I showed on the last slide to those two types of information that go into the equation. So in this example, the formula uses the current allocations as the starting point or the resource utilization information and the um, regional spawning stock biomass estimates from the last stock assessment as the resource distribution information. And it also has a control rule set which caps the regional allocation change at a maximum of 3% per year and the lines on the graph represent the state allocations that come out of the equation and to highlight the difference in the regional effects the states between Massachusetts and New York are shown in shades of blue and New Jersey to North Carolina are shown in shades of red or pink. So for this example, the TMGC equation was applied retrospectively to allocations in recent years. So starting in 2007, you have the current allocations. And then in 2008, that formula um, starts to transition the weights so that the historic information con contributes 90% to the allocations and the resource distribution contributes 10%. And then in each year after that, the weights continue to shift by 10%. So by 2015, it reaches a level where historic information contributes 10% and resource distribution contrib contributes 90. So what you see in the allocations over time is that because the equation is gradually applying more weight to the resource distribution. And during this time period, that proportion of spawning stock biomass in the northern region is increasing. You see the allocations of Massachusetts through New York generally increasing proportionally as well, while the southern region is proportionally decreasing. But what I also want to point out is that from 2014 to 2015, you see the direction of those changes flips so that the southern states are increasing and the north is decreasing and that's because there was a change in the biomass distribution from the assessment during the, that year. So I just wanted to point that out so you can see um, how this approach can result in multi-directional change in allocations to each region. 
And I also wanted to note that the PDT report does provide several retrospective examples of how this approach could be used with different configurations, and it shows how those allocations would have changed in each of those scenarios, but for time I obviously couldn't go through all of those here, but just know that they are there to um, compare. So the next management strategy that the PDT discussed is the trigger-based allocation approach, and this approach would establish a quota trigger or a base level of quota that is always allocated using the current state allocations, and then it would evenly allocate any quota above that trigger value to the states of Massachusetts through North Carolina. And as proposed, Maine and New Hampshire would receive a smaller allocation percentage based on their um, historically low participation in the fishery. And with this option, there were two different trigger levels that were proposed, and those were 3 million and 4 million pounds. And the first is approximately based on the average coastwide commercial quota between 2003 and 2018, but excluding the years where we were using the constant catch approach. Um, the second trigger is approximately based on the highest quota in our time series, which was 4.12 million pounds. So this graph is just to show you how those two trigger values compare to the coastwide quotas from 1998 to 2018. And looking at the 3 million pound quota trigger, which is represented by the orange line, you have 10 coastwide quotas since 1998 that exceeded that trigger. And with the 4 million pound trigger shown by the green line, you have only the 2017 quota exceeding that trigger. This table shows the percent allocations that would be distributed to each state for the quota up to and including the trigger, and those are the current allocations, and then the proportions that each state would get of the quota above the trigger. So you can see in that last column that each state from Massachusetts to North Carolina gets 10.89% of the quota above the trigger, while Maine and New Hampshire get 1% of that additional quota. And this second table is to show how the final state allocations would look if this trigger approach were applied to the 2017 quota of 4.12 million pounds using a three point, or sorry, a three million pound trigger. So you can see the final state allocations in the third column, and then in the last column you see the percent change for that state from that state's current allocation. And I just want to note here that you see allocation increases in the states whose original allocations were lower than the percent of additional quota, so 10.89% um, that they receive of the quota above the trigger value. And that would be true regardless of what trigger value is used. Um, and those states are Maine, New Hampshire, Connecticut, New York, and Delaware. So as the PDT discussed this approach, they also considered how it could be modified to address changes in black sea bass distribution. And the idea that was put forward was to still allocate the quota up to and including the trigger with the um, current allocations, but instead of distributing the quota above the trigger evenly to the states of Massachusetts through North Carolina, they suggested instead allocating the quota above the trigger based on regional biomass. So in the examples that the PDT put together for this modification, they used the row adjusted regional SSB in 2015, which is the terminal year of the stock assessment, and those values result in regional biomass proportions of 86% for the northern region and 14% for the southern region. So using this approach, additional quota it, above the trigger would first be allocated to each region based on those proportions, and then for allocating that additional quota within each region, the PDT proposed two different options. One would be to allocate equally to the states within each region, and the other is to allocate to the states within each region based on, in proportion to their historic allocations. And there are examples of both methods in the PDT report. And this slide here is just to visualize the trigger approach as it was originally proposed. So you have the quota up to the trigger in blue distributed based on the current allocations. And then here the quota above the trigger shown in green is being distributed to the states equally except for Maine and New Hampshire which get 1% each. And then you can compare that to the modification developed by the PDT. Um, and you can see in this case, the quota above the trigger is being split up regionally based on those biomass distribution proportions from the stock assessment and then split equally or um, 
proportionally to the states within each region. And the percent allocation that each state would end up with would be dependent on which of those two methods are chosen. Um, and I want to point out here that this modified trigger approach does maintain the smaller proportion for Maine and New Hampshire, but here they're, they're getting that 1% each, but it's coming directly from the northern region's proportion rather than from the coastwide quota above the trigger. For the trigger approach, the PDT also highlighted a few considerations that might require some more thought if this option were to move forward. Um, first, they noted that though three and four million pounds were proposed as two options for a trigger value, there may also be other appropriate options to consider depending on what the desired outcome is. Um, and second, they noted that again, there's multiple ways to choose how to allocate quota above the trigger, um, whether that's evenly or in proportion to historic allocations or in some other proportions. Um, so that would be another decision point for this approach. And then lastly, the group also brought up the idea of using a soft trigger instead of a hard trigger. And a soft trigger would be allocating a certain percentage of the quota above a trigger um, based on the current allocations and the rest of it um, based on a different set of allocations. So the PDT thought that this might also be something the board would want to consider. So the last of the quota allocation strategies that the PDT discusses the idea of an auctioned seasonal quota or ASQ system. And to be clear, in this case, the season refers to the full fishing year. So this auction would occur on an annual basis. Um, and the idea that was put forward is to annually set aside a small portion of the quota, probably 10 to 20% to start um, looking at this option. And that would be available for auction to harvesters in the Black Sea Bass Management Unit with all the required permits. And the auctionable quota would then be divided into smaller auction blocks by whichever agency is administering the auction. And there could be certain rules established to limit the amount of quota that any one permittee can get um, in any year in order to reduce quota consolidation. Um, so all interested participants would be able to bid on those quota blocks and then the highest bidders would be awarded with that quota. And any funds gained from the auction would be funneled back into administration and enforcement of the auction. So this is the idea as it was generally laid out in the proposal, but there's obviously a lot of additional details that would need to be hammered out if this is of interest. Um, and quickly, I'll just provide a summary of the pros and cons that the PDT discussed with this approach. Um, and there is more detail on this in the PDT report as well. But on the positive side, the auction could potentially increase fishery efficiency by directing quota to harvesters with the greatest capacity to take advantage of that quota. And it could also be a relatively flexible way of allocating quota independently from state allocations. Um, however, the PDT did highlight a number of concerns and challenges involved with running and administering this type of program. Um, and because of the nature of this program, it would need to be administered by either NOAA Fisheries or by ASMFC. And both of those organizations have a number of concerns about running this type of program. Um, for NOAA, this includes the fact that if they were running it, they would only be able to auction quota to vessels with federal moratorium permits under the FMP regulations, and that would exclude state-only permitted vessels. Um, they also noted that they would not be able to monitor landings at the vessel-specific level, so that would make enforcement difficult. Um, there's also a concern that, quota, that a quota auction could lead to consolidation of quota in the hands of operations with the most capital. And there's also uncertainty about how this program would interact with the ITQ systems that are already established in some of the mid-Atlantic states. Um, and lastly, because we don't have the appropriate appropriate socioeconomic data at this point, it would be really difficult for us to analyze and predict the impacts of this type of program. So the PDT emphasized that if this program is of interest, um, it would require a high level of effort to develop. So they felt that if it moves forward, it would need to be the sole focus of the PDT. So in addition to those three strategies, um, the PDT also talked about the possibility of combining options to create a hybrid approach. So for example, it could take 50% of the quota and allocate it using status quo allocations and allocate the other 50% using something like TMGC or the trigger approach. Um, but the PDT noted that if 
this is of interest. Um, it would be important to weigh any potential flexibility that's gained from using a hybrid approach against any potential increases in complexity and possible confusion among the public, since combining approaches might make it more difficult to parse out what the impacts of each component of the hybrid approach are. So at the end of the PDT report, after considering all of these different approaches, um, they laid out some broader decision points to help the board think through the potential management strategies um, that have been proposed related to black sea bass commercial state allocations. So first, the PDT noted that it might be beneficial to have a clear, to set a clear understanding of the board's intentions or objectives um, with looking at commercial ad allocation changes in order to provide some direction to the PDT if a management action moves forward. Um, the PDT also noted that for the options where there's a regional component, the board should consider the best way of allocating to states within each region, um, as was mentioned during the discussion of the trigger approach. Um, additionally, the PDT emphasized that the regional biomass information that we have and that we used in the examples have, um, that may change depending on the outcome of the operational assessment. Um, it's still uncertain whether that assessment will be able to produce regional biomass estimates, and if it doesn't, then the board may need to consider using something else like federal survey data or a combination of federal and state survey data to get regional information. Um, Another decision point is how to define the regional configurations in these approaches, and most of the examples that the PDT put together used Massachusetts through New York as the northern region and New Jersey through North Carolina as the southern region, but the board could con consider some different configurations if it was deemed more appropriate. Um, for example, the discussion about Maine and New Hampshire was something the PDT brought up and how to treat those two states, as well as potentially um, treating New Jersey as a separate region like it was done in recreational black sea bass. Um, Lastly, the PDT discussed the idea of stability in the fishery. Um, maintaining stability has been a concern for a number of states as we've had these discussions, and it's not clearly defined what stability means, so it might be useful for the board to define stability in terms of either a maximum percent change in allocations or a minimum allocation or quota level that states would be comfortable with. So to wrap up my presentation, I have some next steps here for the board. So today the board may consider initiating a management action to address black sea bass commercial allocation issues. And as the PDT noted, it might be helpful to determine what the objectives of that management action would be in order to guide the board in choosing which strategies should be considered. Um, and I'll also note here that the type of management document needed would probably depend on the options the board wants to consider. The board might also want to think about a potential timeline for developing a management action. So for reference, um, this is an example timeline of what it could look like if an addendum were initiated today. So a draft document could be developed this summer with the options the board is interested in considering, and then those options could be reviewed in August, but they likely wouldn't be fully fleshed out. Um, and the board will not be able to review the operational assessment until October, so it might be appropriate to wait until October to consider approving a draft addendum for public comment until we have that updated stock size and distribution information. Um, if the board were to approve a document for public comment in October, then public hearings could be held from November to December, and the board could consider the document for final approval in February 2020 at the earliest. Um, so if it was approved in February 2020, that would make it difficult to implement for the 2020 fishing year, so it might be necessary to consider an implementation, implementation date of 2021. Um, so that is what I have for this presentation. Thank you for bearing with me. And I think we could take a second for any quick questions. Yeah, I also, we have the AP report, and I was thinking that it might be good to run through that sort of next in sequence and then get to questions and then get to discussion. So if it's okay with the board, I'd like to just encourage Caitlin to move through the AP uh, presentation next, and then we'll uh, circle back to questions and discussion. So why don't we do that, Caitlin? All right, sounds good. So the advisory panel um, did have a meeting jointly with the council advisory panel on April 2nd to go over these potential management options for commercial black sea bass. 
and at that meeting we had 12 commission advisors in attendance and 16 council advisors in attendance. 14 of those were representatives of the commercial sector, 10 of the recreational sector, and three that overlap with both. And six additional comments were set to a, sent to us via email after the meeting, and those were included in the summary as well. So in the next few slides, I'll just go over the AP's comments related to each of the proposed approaches that we just discussed. So regarding status quo, 10 advisors were in support of status quo commercial allocations and the reasons that they gave included that the southern states are still catching their full quotas and that there's too much uncertainty regarding both what the resource distribution looks like now a few years after the stock assessment as well as the impacts of the proposed approaches for reallocation. And two advisors opposed status quo, um, referencing that resource availability in the northern states is high, but the current quotas do not allow them to have um, the ability to take advantage of that availability. For TMGC, um, six advisors opposed that approach, most of whom were from New Jersey to North Carolina. And the reasons that they gave for the opposition were that they felt the results of the approach are too uncertain and that it's unfair to the southern states and that the allocations would not actually respond in real time to changes in biomass distribution. Um, and lastly, that there are still concerns about using the Northeast Fishery Science Center trawl survey data to inform um, regional allocations. There were also two advisors from Massachusetts and New York that supported the TMGC approach. And then uh, one general comment that was given on this approach was that a minimum allocation level should be set in, in the approach so that state allocations can't drop too low. Based, um, looking at the trigger approach, there were three advisors that commented in support, and their comments included that this option would protect investments in the fishery, um, that areas where black sea bass has expanded should be able to get some of that excess quota, and that it's a start towards more flexibility for the northern region. Six advisors said that they supported continued evaluation of this approach, though they didn't necessarily support it at the time, and they noted that it needs further development before they could support it, and the focus should first be on getting updated stock information before looking into a, an approach like this. As for the ASQ approach, eight advisors opposed it and only one supported it. And those opposing comments included that it would cause the same issues as the research set-aside program, but under, under a different name, that, that it would produce more Carlos Rafaels, and that those with more capital shouldn't necessarily get more quota. And the supporter of the ASQ comment said that maybe a letter of authorization program could be used to uh, improve if, if enforcement of a program like this. So the advisors also gave a few more general comments on black sea bass commercial management, and one theme that they addressed was that changes to allocations shouldn't be made until after the operational assessment is complete. Another comment that was given by multiple advisors was that the black sea bass stock is not shifting to the north, but rather expanding. One advisor um, also commented that it makes more sense to in include New Jersey in the northern region than it does in the southern region. And another commented on the need to reduce bycatch mortality and suggested that quotas could be subdivided by gear type. And finally, there was a comment that abundance should also be considered in the regional approaches um, in addition to biomass. So that is what I have for the AP report, and I figured I would just put this slide back up um, to bring us back to the board's discussion for today. So with that, I can take any questions. Thanks so much, Caitlin. And I really do want to just pause briefly and just thank the members of the PDT uh, for what I think is really has been Yeoman's work on this initial analysis. I think the report was extremely well written, and I think Caitlin's presentation was excellent. I also want to thank the members of the AP, the joint AP, so both from the council and, and commission. Uh, for their input, which again was, I thought, very meaningful and helpful and uh, well detailed in the report. Uh, so with that, we're going to first take questions uh, on the presentation that Caitlin just pre uh, provided. We'll then be spending the bulk of the, or the rest of the meeting, uh, pretty much on a discussion uh, regarding these issues, so uh, we'll move to that discussion um, after we take questions. So first will be questions. Adam Nowalski. Thank you. The presentation on timeline showed a timeline for an addendum. Should we be considering this as an amendment process as well, 
or if we go through this process, it would be by addendum only. Thanks, Adam. Um, so you could choose to do this through an addendum if it was just an action that were to alter the state by state allocations, but something like the ASQ approach would require an addendum. So it really just depends on the options that are wanting to be considered. I think she meant would require an amendment um, uh, for the latter. Adam, a follow? So ASQ would require an amendment, TMGC or trigger could be done through addendum, but could either of those first two, could we choose to do it through an amendment process if we so desired? Yeah, I think that's the board's prerogative. Um, either, either option is available. Additional questions, David Borden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm looking at one comment by Mr. Rule on page three, and I was just wondering if, if anybody could explain what the basis for the comment. I'll just read it short. He's talking about the uh, performance of the trawl, uh, the NOAA trawl project, and, he, and it, he's quoted as saying, 49% of the toes are invalid by their own admission. Is there any basis for that? For that? Is there a factual basis for that statement? See Mike Luisi's hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To the question, um, I can't, I can't say whether or not the, that value is is accurate. I would assume that um, that Mr. Rule, in his in his work with the Northeast um, Trawl Advisory Panel, that that I sit on as a as a member of the Mid-Atlantic Council. So the the council's been working with the Northeast Fisheries Science Center um, in evaluating the trawl survey. And over the last year, there has been a, the identification by the Science Center for a high, a high number of their trawls have fallen. The, this, and this is getting outside of the, the specifics of w what I understand about how trawls work. But the, the, the um, geometry of the trawl has been outside of what has been defined as an optimal trawl setting. Um, and therefore, it's been agreed that a high number of these trawls that have been conducted over the years have been outside of that, which means that it's not, they're, not, they're not fishing at that optimum geometry to capture the fish being targeted. Um, I, don't, I saw Dr. Hare here earlier. I don't want to necessarily put him on the spot, but he, he might be better to explain um, and, and answer your question. I just thought I'd give you what I know. John. Dr. Hare, are you better able to explain and respond? And if you are, please do so. Thank you. I'll try, and you can determine if I'm better able. How's that? Um, so John Hare, Northeast Fisheries Science Center Director. You know, we very much appreciate working with Captain Rule um, on the NEMAP and working with the Trawl Advisory Panel. I think the, I don't know if 49% is the right number or not, but there are some large number of Northeast Fisheries Science Center trawls which are outside of the specific bounds that are placed in terms of the sort of how the trawl is worked on NEMAP. Um, and it's an issue which the Northeast Trawl Advisory Panel and the Northeast Fisheries Science Center is looking at. Um, the way we've been approaching it is several fold. One is doing field work both on the Bigelow and on commercial vessels to understand the magnitude. Um, uh, Captain Rule uses the word invalid, um, but you know, I, I don't know, I wouldn't use the word invalid, but there is, you know, the catchability of a trawl when it's not the optimal uh, shape is a question and we're trying to sort of quantify what that catchability is in these different trawl performance uh, areas, sort of deep water, mid-shelf, and shallow water. The other approach that we are taking is we're going to do some flume tank work to look at the trawl under different sort of spreads. Um, that work was scheduled for January. Because of the shutdown, we were unable to do it, and we're in the process of rescheduling that work. That will also be open to the, the trawl advisory panel as a group. Um, and then the third approach that we are taking is looking at, as we do an assessment, looking at the potential impact of catchability in the trawl, in the range of toes, uh, and how that would sort of 
impact the index that's coming out of the Bigelow and then how that would impact an assessment. And we've done it so far with the yellowtail flounder. Um, yellowtail flounder, its depth distribution is in sort of the mid-range, which is where the trawl is performing well, so there was minimal impact. Um, and it was also looked at in the summer flounder assessment. Uh, the Bigelow time series was adjusted for catchability as the NTAP group thought that the catchability might be impacted. Um, and so that was included in the assessment. So we are going to continue to work on this. Um, I think the term invalid, I wouldn't use that term, but there are a large number, a large percentage of trawls which are outside of the narrow bounds um, which uh, the NEMAP survey is conducted under. But we are going to work, continue to work on this. David, uh, did you ever follow David? Please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hare. It, it, just so I'm clear in my own mind, is this a uh, problem with the NOAA troll and, uh, project the, or the NEMAP uh, project? No, it's a, or, NOAA, or it's a NOAA. It's a Northeast Fishery Science Center trawl survey issue. The NEMAP survey has very tight protocols, and, you know, Captain Rule uh, fishes very efficiently, uses the protocols, and then they throw out any trawl which is outside of the bounds. Okay, thank you. So it's, thank not a, it's not a, just to be clear, it's not an issue of the NEMAP survey, it's an issue of the Northeast Fishery Science Center trawl survey. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Additional questions? Nicola, Meserve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, with regards to the trigger approach, the PDT offered up two trigger levels, a three and four million pound trigger. Um, and, and looking at the four million pound trigger, there's only one year in the time series where he would have been above that. So I I'm, I'm, guess I'm looking for a little more context as to the PDT's discussion as to how that would have provided for meaningful reallocation and possibly whether it was based on an assumption that we might have higher quotas in the future, similar to what happened with Fluke recently and the, and the new assessment. Thank you. Caitlin? Thank you. Um, the PDT didn't put those two options forward. That was put forward with the original proposal by Rob O'Reilly. So he might have um, something to say about those two options. But the PDT did suggest that there might be other levels that could be considered. Rob, do you want to weigh in? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Caitlin, for your report. And yes, that's exactly it. So uh, we came through a very nice assessment result in 2016. Um, we keep hearing about the tremendous biomass and abundance of black sea bass um, throughout the range. So I think there should be an expectation that quotas will indeed um, remain somewhat on the higher end than they have since 2003 overall. And if that's the case, then it makes sense to bracket this trigger point uh, evaluation with a high value. Um, that's the only reason to do that. The three million uh, pound trigger point is a little different in that is the average over time, with the exception of the years where constant catch was what the fishery was bound by. And so, you know, really, I think it's just a matter of. of one comment that we just looked at was from the AP was let's see essentially what the next assessment looks like as well. And then there is a choice there. There's a choice. You have a three million pound trigger, which you saw has quite a few entries of quotas above that. And then the four million only one now. So it's sort of planning for the future. That's what we hope the future looks like. Um, the other part, if I may, Mr. Chair, to talk about that option for just a second more is that um, certainly putting in the option and having the PDT come out with a variation is fine on the soft trigger. It's just that um, I'm wondering if it was looked at as a way to have an intersection with the TMGC approach where I realize it's early, nothing was really done on the soft trigger, there was sort of a uh, recommendation there that if it was 50 percent, and a couple of examples are given in the document, you know, but clearly that's sort of bridging um, the two approaches a little bit uh, because the TMGC would also at some point, some number of years, end up with that situation as a soft trigger would as well. And I'm wondering, did the PDT have a discussion about that? Was that the rationale for the soft trigger? So thank you. I'm not sure, but Caitlin, you want to take a stab at that? Sure. Um, 
I don't know if it was exactly the rationale for looking at a soft trigger, but it was just another idea that was brought up by the PDT of something that could be done. And it does kind of intersect with the hybrid approaches part of the PDT report. So you could choose to use kind of a soft trigger to set 50% that's going to be allocated based on the current um, allocations and then something above that could be allocated using TMGC, but it could also be allocated using the trigger approach, and it could also be allocated in a different way. It was just a suggestion that they also put forward for consideration. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Joe Semino. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Caitlin. That's a great, great presentation. I think you may have a slide that we didn't have. Could you bring up the, the TMGC example? Well, actually, it might help if I, I, I speak to this a little bit. What we saw in the document was some very smooth lines that looked like they had long time periods um, with examples that had, um, it talks about regional distribution assumptions being based on spawning stock biomass by region from the assessment time period 2004 to 2012. So I don't know if I'm putting you or Jay on the spot. And those long time periods and the projections that we have in the document is that a single value for the biomass and then just using all the other uh, levers, if you will, to slowly adjust it over time? And is this doing something different? I guess it must be because it's changing throughout the... Caitlin's going to take a stab at that. I'll try, and if Jay is around, maybe he can correct me if I'm wrong. But I believe the examples that were provided in the report are also retrospective, which did allow them to use the changing biomass information from the stock assessment, so it shouldn't be a constant value that was used for those projections. I see Jay in the back nodding his head in the affirmative, so that it, he's concurring with, with uh, Caitlin's response. So then there was the potential for each year. It could have been a jagged line of it's, it, it's shifting towards the northern states, but a, a year or two later, the for whatever reason, the, the trawl survey would bring it back to the southern states. That That's happening in the projections? Okay, I wasn't, that was something that was not clear, thank you. Thank you, a Adam? Let me build on that question then. In the examples that we saw, the quotas that were shown in a given year, how far did the assessment lag in terms of the information used for that decision. Were we essentially seeing a quota in a given year was based on distribution from four or more years prior in those examples? I understand the TMGC approach talked about and the PDT review talked about the concerns about the lag between an assessment and actually using it, which would be on this four-year timeline approximately, versus possibly using state surveys or something else. But for the examples that we're looking at, are we looking at essentially a four-year lag between when we're going to have a quota for fishermen to utilize and the distribution that that would have been based on? I, I think the answer is yes, that, we, that the uh, projections were based on the um, assessments that were done and the projections associated with those assessments. And so if yes to your uh, comment, there was a lag, there is a lag, there always is with regard to uh, looking back on the most recent assessment. And I believe that's how these projections were developed. Yeah. Right, and each time there's an update, you know, that would get folded in. So that's, that's the concept, and that was the attempt uh, made here with regard to these examples to show how it would have played out had the information, you know, had this process been in place and based on the information we had in hand. So it looks like that answered the question. Mike Luisi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And based on Adam's question, would, could we assume that the same lag would be um, – part of the formula that would go into the regional biomass example for the trigger alternative rather than an equal distribution of the extra fish above the trigger. I mean, I would, I would assume that there would be some basis to assign that those differences within the region, which would also be lagged. Is, can we assume that? 
Yeah, I believe that's the case. Any further questions? Nicola? To this point, Mr. Chairman, um, the, the assessments are on a two-year schedule, right, moving forward. The next one's in 2021. That would include data through 2020. But in 2021, we get the assessment. There's only a one-year lag between incorporating data on regional biomass from 2020 into the approach for the next year if you were doing it on an every two-year basis that followed the assessment. So I'm not seeing, you know, as much concern about a multi-year lag in incorporating stock information into that approach. Right now, we're not doing it at all. So it's certainly an improvement beyond that. Thank you. Thank you. With that, let's see if we can pivot now to a, to discussion. And uh, I'm just going to kind of reset that discussion briefly. Uh, the working group report, which preceded the PDT report, identified two main issues. The first being state commercial allocations implemented in 2003 do not reflect the current distribution of the resource, which has expanded significantly north of Hudson Canyon. And two, federal coastwide quota management can limit harvest opportunities for some states if another state's harvest overage results in a coastwide fishery closure. That second issue, identified by the working group, is slated to be addressed in collaboration with the Mid-Atlantic Council and NOAA Fisheries and will likely be brought back for consideration at our next joint meeting in October, or as early as that. Um, the first issue is what we want to focus on today. The PDT undertook an initial analysis of management options and alternatives suggested by members of the board. As noted in the report and by Caitlin in her presentation, some of the options relate well to the problem statement, others less so. Thus, it would behoove the board to offer a clearer sense of direction to the PDT regarding the board's intent on the issue of reallocation. In other words, what is the primary purpose for re revisiting allocations for commercial black sea bass, and what is the primary goal for the options and alternatives to be further developed and considered? One version offered solely for the purposes of seeding today's discussion might be something like this. Given the shift in resource distribution and abundance, the board should consider changes in commercial allocation to provide fair and equitable access to the resource by better aligning allocations with updated scientific, scientific information on resource distribution and abundance while affording due consideration to the socioeconomic needs and interests of coastal communities. That straw man language draws from the initial problem statement developed by the working group and comports with key relevant provisions in the commission's strategic plan. And I reviewed that plan and I have them in front of me, but I, I can circle back to them if anybody wishes. I'm game to put that straw man goal statement um, that I just offered up on the screen for purposes of seeding today's discussion upon request. Um, but won't do so unless so requested. So I just wanted to kind of set the stage and now open the floor to discussion on a proposed goal statement um, or and, and any other set of objectives related thereto. That's one. Two, some clarification and guidance as to which management strategies the PDT should continue developing. And three, what our potential timeline should be as we move forward with this initiative. So those are the sort of three, I want to frame this discussion with regard to those three issues. I think they're the same, uh, it was bracketed the same way in uh, Caitlin's slide. So um, just kind of resetting this next phase of our meeting today. Uh, and with that, I will now open the floor to discussion, comments, suggestions. I don't anticipate the need for motions. We're not adopting anything today. We're really just uh, in a mode of, of trying to provide guidance on these issues, but it's an important uh, step in the process because it will inform what happens uh, over the next several months. So with that, uh, the floor is open for anyone who wishes to weigh in on any of those um, questions or any of the issues that have been uh, uh, raised. Who would like to go first? Tom Fody. I asked a while ago about when we're doing biomass that we basically put it in numbers of fish and compare the numbers of fish over the period of time because as we know black sea bass like summer flounder if you put higher size limits you re reallocate by doing that because the bigger fish move north. So I'm looking at what's, what was the figures of by by numbers of fish that 
basically has that changed over the period of time? I can understand why they get bigger fish because basically like summer flounder, black sea bass, they do the old go out to the canyon and come back further north as they go as they get larger. So we've been providing a nursery for, in the south for the, the big fish to go north. And when we started raising the size limit, we did over the years from the smaller size limit on black sea bass and summer flounder, we started doing a reallocation ourselves of where the biomass because the bigger fish are up north. So I've asked for that a couple of times. I wonder if we could get that we finally start really looking at this. Thank you. And I, before I go to the next hand, I just want to note that I misspoke when I said no uh, motion would be needed. A motion would clearly be needed if we were to initiate a management action today. So I, I just want to clarify that point. Um, so on these issues, who's ready to weigh in and provides, provide guidance on, the, uh, on some of these areas? David Borden? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't, I don't have a problem with the statement that you put up there. Uh, I do have um, some issues with some of the options that are in the document, specifically the auction op option I think should be taken out unless somebody can convince me that they've fixed, fixed uh, problems that manifested themselves with the RSA project. But uh, um, so if you want to just focus on this, I'm happy with this statement. Thank you. Just to kind of keep the, moving, uh, the meeting moving along well, is there any, how, do, how does the board feel about this straw man proposal for a goal statement? I say this, I'm pointing to the um, uh, language that's up on the board. Uh, again, this was just offered based on what I drew from, uh, based on drawing from the sort of record, if you will, the problem statement developed by the working group principles that I drew uh, upon from the uh, Commission's guiding documents. Does this speak to the purpose uh, upon which we, this board, is looking to move forward with this issue of, of revisiting uh, commercial allocation? And if there's no objection, we can, uh, again, this is not, we're not formally adopting anything today. We're just making sure that we're clear on what it is that we're looking to achieve. Is there any objection or any recommended changes to this language? Uh, John Clark. It would just be a clarification, uh, Bob. I'm just wondering by having a goal like this, are we saying as, as we get further into these discussions, which if summer flounder is any indication are going to be long and excruciating, um, that we would have to, you know, base any allocation on, you know, we set on our goal we were going to allocate based on the new distribution of the species, which um, is directly, it, it almost seems that this goal would say the status quo is not an option. And I know from, just from what we saw from the AP report, for example, status quo is favored by a lot of the fishermen in our region. So I just want to make it clear that if that goal is in there, there could be a situation where uh, status quo is something that would not be seen as an option. I would, my response would be status quo is always an option and, and the key word here is the first word, consider. So this is just indicating the purpose upon or by which uh, this initiative would move forward. It doesn't mean that it has to, anything has to be adopted, but it would, it would guide the development of the options and alternatives. John? And just, um, I have, I understand, you know, Dave said to remove the auction option. I had come up with that, just didn't put much effort into that because I didn't figure it would go anywhere. But one of the real advantages that was not really brought up in the PDT report was that it would take us out of this allocation effort here because we'd have a situation where the allocation would be allocated based on whoever would be best able to take advantage of it. And um, I think what I've heard from some of the joint meetings is there's already a de facto reallocation going on in that quota, some of the quota from uh, permit holders in some of the southern states has been brought up, bought by commercial boats in other states. So in any event, as I said, I certainly understand the difficulties with going to that, but um, it would be one thing to think about for the future to try to avoid these, these long drawn out allocation arguments. Understood. Thanks, Mike. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm certainly um, I'm comfortable with what's on the board and, um, and what we're discussing here. I'm happy that the, begin the first sentence doesn't reference shifts or expansion and that we've kind of steered clear of that and we're talking more about um, distribution and abundance. I think there's a debate still over whether or not the stock is shifting or if it's just been redistributed redistrib and expanding in certain areas. So I think that um, I I'd be happy to, to leave that alone. Uh, and last, just for the record, um, I'm assuming that, and reading the, reading the last part of the sentence, the socioeconomic needs and interest of coastal communities is in reference to what's been developed over the time that the allocations have allowed for those states to capitalize and, and put forth in their communities the, the, you know, the, the harvest of that resource at the level that they're harvesting now. So I think in my mind, this does address the issue, but it also secures to some degree that historical nature of the fishery uh, as an important element as we move forward. Thanks. Thank you, I think you put it well. That's certainly my take. Uh, Eric Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a, a question about our current um, utilization of the resource. Is there any state that's underperforming on their current quota? I, well, I'm going to let Caitlin answer that. I, I, she just whispered in my ear, but I want to go ahead and put that on the record. I have taken a look at the recent years, um, and there isn't any state that's significantly and consistently underperforming. It, it does alter from year to year, and there's only been a couple of states in the last few years that have been under the under their quota, but it's only been by a few percent. So why don't we, uh, by consensus, uh, agree that there that the uh, goal statement that's on the board is is worth uh, ad adopting. Uh, but I use that word loosely with a small a uh, for the purposes of guiding future development. And I was next going to turn to the. Uh, um, the management strategies and options, but Adam, you have your hand up. Go ahead. My one concern with this approach is that it tells us, in my opinion, relatively prescriptively, that fair and equitable access is based on resource distribution and abundance. I don't disagree with the statement that resource distribution and abundance should be one of the considerations, but I have a level of discomfort with this statement as written, whereby fair and equitable access to the resource by better aligning allocations. I would be more comfortable with replacing by better with something along the lines of including consideration of whereby we're clearly identifying this as something we want to consider, but I appreciate the effort you've put here in terms of trying to guide us. I'm just uncomfortable with the focus on that as the means for equitable access. And I appreciate that. I, I would just kind of revisit Mike Luisi's comment, and that is that the last part, you know, is aimed at identifying a second key factor, uh, socioeconomic needs and interests of coastal communities. You could say balanced by or, you know, in due consideration um, to that. So I, I sort of read this as, as addressing two key factors. The one that you just spoke to uh, is one, but it's not limited to that. It's also sort of balanced by or also uh, complemented by that, that last part. But to your point, if if the language were changed to just say including consideration of is that it leaves it more open-ended it, it means that other factors could be introduced and I guess the point that I would want to s focus on today is what other what would those other factors be and if so let's try and identify them now if this is missing pieces let's try to get those missing pieces in Adam I think historical allocation is the first one that was highlighted by the working group here. And I don't disagree that while affording due consideration touches on that, I don't think it's as clear that saying historical allocation 
or whatever it might be. And, and I don't, I, I'm not think we have to list them all. I think having gone through the summer flounder process, we've touched on a lot of the issues. So I'm just looking to whatever they may be, whether they're here today, I don't view this as a guiding principle for the next three weeks, three months, or three years, Mr. Chairman. I think this is something this board could hold true of for a longer period of time, potentially. So I think it's important that we don't box ourselves into a corner by saying fair and equitable access is defined by aligning allocations with updated scientific information without stating that that's just one of the items we want to. If you specifically need another, I would offer historical allocation as an item to had here as another example if you needed one. Thank you. So responses to Adam's suggestion. Um, that we, uh, Tony, sounds like you've got an idea. I just have a question, Adam. I would, so the way I, and maybe it's by interpretation, which is, will be a qu subject to question or something, I don't know. But so by saying that we're trying to better align allocations with updated scientific information on resource distribution and abundance, it's, I would say that, underlying that is the historical allocation. So that's what you're starting with is historical allocation. And then this is saying that you want to consider changes to take those historical allocations and somewhere realign how much you realign is a big question with this updated information on distribution and abundance. So I'm trying to think like how to fit that fit that in, because this sort of goal statement or whatever we're going to call it is telling you how you're shift, what you're considering the options to shift to. And so if you already have historical allocation as the underlying current allocation, then how do you blend that in here? Do you know what I'm saying? Adam? And then so this is the crux of the issue, is that is resource distribution and abundance the right way to reallocate? That, that's the question that's put before us. My point is that's one consideration. I'm not comfortable leaving this room with that being the phrase that we're using as the means for fair and equitable access. I think the AP was very clear in highlighting that. And I think we would be doing the AP process a huge disservice by essentially disregarding that. Again, I was fine with leaving it. My specific suggestion was just replacing buy better with including consideration of I thought that left this as a focus, but didn't explicitly say this was our means for fair and equitable access. And I think it comes down to what, if you are in favor of abundance distribution as the means for reallocation, then you could say, okay, this includes historical allocation. This includes all the other things because you like this. If you have concerns that that way forward is not necessarily the best way forward. I think it's clear where I land on the issue here. Uh, I think you're going to have some more considerations and you're going to look for a little bit more consideration of the other side of the coin. I, I, I don't know what more I could say than that. I mean, this is, this is a decision the board ultimately has to make in how we move forward. <clears throat> And that's my proposed way forward is by changing by better to including consideration of. Thank you. Uh, take Tom, and then I, we do want to kind of come to terms on this, move to the other issues, and, and we're, we're about 15 minutes away from, I think, wrap, needing to wrap up. So we do have to move through this as quickly as we can. Tom Fody. As I read this, it says that we haven't been fair and equitable in the way we've been managing black sea bass. That's what you just said here consider change commercial to provide fair and equitable are we not doing that now and by doing it historically now we're talking differently I mean I, I agree with Adam this wording is not the right wording okay Eric yeah thank thank you mr. chairman um, 
Yeah, other than I'm trying to avoid a nervous breakdown at, at this moment, um, I do agree with Adam because my definition of better is going to be substantially different than maybe Rob O'Reilly's, for example. So I, I agree with Adam that we should change that a little bit. Okay, and what I'm thinking is that we don't necessarily have to arrive at a, uh, a finite decision today on the exact wording. We can certainly take the board's input and, and work on continuing to craft this goal statement. It's, it's so we're, we're trying to move the ball forward. It doesn't mean we have to score a touchdown today. Um, but, I, but we do need to get through a couple of other issues, so I'll take uh, two or three additional comments, uh, Joe, Matt, and Rob, and then we'll need to move on to the next issue. Joe, Samino. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I think, you know, to me, socioeconomic means more than just the historical allocation. The fact that we're going to set something in motion that is constantly shifting, I think we've seen the concerns with summer flounder industry saying, even in Rhode Island, where they're saying we might benefit at Town Dock, but this does not seem safe to us. The concept of telling sea bass fishermen, you know, you're, you're going to lose this quota for 10 years, but don't worry, you may get it back. You know, in that amount of time, if they had to sell their sea bass pots to survive, <laughs> getting it back in 10 years isn't exactly helpful to them. So I think we, moving forward, socioeconomic needs puts a lot of onus on us to do something we don't always do and have good information on the gear types, on the capacity of the fisheries, uh, on the capacity of the docks and, and stuff like that. Thank you. Uh, Matt Gates? Hi, uh, thank you. Um, I think the, the allocations originally set in 2003 were probably uh, what, what people thought of at the time as fair and, and probably were fair at the time. But the, the change in resource distribution has, you know, created a situation where it's, it's a lot, I think, less fair for certain states, Connecticut being one of them with um, a 1 percent share of the allocation. Um, so I think I like keeping the term better aligning with allocations with updated scientific information. Uh, I wouldn't want to make it worse than it is now. So I think keeping better in there is a good descriptor of that. Gotcha. Uh, let me go to Rob and Maureen, and then we're going to move on. Rob? Um, Joe's covered my thoughts there, so thank you. Thank you. Maureen? Thank you. Uh, Right now, the board is considering changes in the commercial allocation to black sea bass. Obviously, we, we can foresee which states might want change and which states don't want to change. Are we considering changing our commercial allocations to black sea bass? If we're not, for whatever, for historical reasons, for socioeconomic reasons, fine. But I think that if we're going to change the allocations for black sea bass, we have to have some justification for why we're changing it and the direction we're going to go in the change and what we're going to use as the basis for making these decisions. I know this is hard. I got to watch part, parts of the summer flounder discussion. I don't want to go back to the basis, but I really want to ask, do we want to change it? I mean, I'm from New York, I want to change it. But there are other states that are comfortable where they are now. Before we start arguing, are we willing to consider real change to our black sea bass commercial allocations? Thank you. Thank you. So I, I'm going to take this position. We have not reached consensus on a goal statement. We have some language that I think is uh, something that we can uh, circle back to, incorporating input received today by the board, and then bring it back before the board at our next meeting. I, I don't think we're going to uh, achieve uh, you know, any sort of sense of finality on this today. What I'd like to do next is just see if, and this is a little awkward because the next issue has to relate to this first issue, but that is, are there any alternatives or options that are currently in uh, being analyzed by the PDT 
that should be struck, or are there any new options or alternatives that should be added? And this would be for the purpose of uh, giving guidance and direction to the BDT and their continuing efforts to work on this issue. I'd like to get some input on, on those questions. They're related. Anything new to be added? Anything that's in there now to be struck? Uh, Emily Gilbert? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. So. Um, Garfo's input on the ASQ approach, the uh, auction seasonal quota approach, was already discussed a bit during the presentation, um, and it's discussed more in the PDT document itself. But I just wanted to reiterate that given the difficulty in effectively enforcing, uh, monitoring, and managing such a program, in addition to the limitations of staff and resources to um, administer an auction, and these are thoughts similarly shared by the commission, uh, commission staff, that we'd, we'd have strong reservations over our ability to ultimately be able to successfully implement um, that program on. So that's my comment. So that echoes sentiments that David Borden uh, mentioned earlier. Are there any other thoughts on this? Is, and I would put it in the form of, is there any objection to removing the, uh, what are we calling, we're calling it the auction the, I'm sorry, I forget the name. The ASQ option. Is there any objection to removing that from the document for now? Sorry, John. Appreciate the, the, uh, the it was teed up well, and I thought it, I thought it actually received a good amount of analysis, and um, I, I don't sense that you're objecting to removing it for now. It can certainly be placed on a back burner and be brought forward again, but for now, in terms of, you know, focusing our resources, is there any objection to pulling that? third part, that third option. I see no objection, so we'll take that as a consensus uh, uh, opinion on the part of the board. And then the last issue is the timeline, and this does relate to the court, sort of core final issue, and that is whether or not there's any interest in, in uh, uh, formally uh, initiating an addendum or any sort of management action. I guess it could be an amendment today. That doesn't need to happen. It could, but certainly um, it relates to the timeline. and. Uh, Caitlin, if you could put that timeline, the, the uh, one that you had uh, offered up back on the board f uh, to help, that would be uh, wonderful. Rob O'Reilly? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I didn't know you were closing the door on the options, so I do have a comment on that, if I may. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the in February meeting, um, winter meeting, at the very end, um, the chair allowed other options to be brought forward. And at the time, uh, just speaking about my thought process, having one option available at that time, the TMGC, with four key decision points, which I could see would be a big um, hurdle to overcome to figure out when, where, and who's going to make those decisions with that approach, I did supply uh, both you and Caitlin with the trigger point um, approach. And I think the PDT certainly is welcome to flesh out other options, but by putting in the soft trigger, um, it sort of mutes the effect of what I had intended when I supplied that. Now, granted, um, I borrowed that from elsewhere you know, from the flounder document, the summer flounder commercial amendment document, and made some modifications for the constant catch um, to not include that. But to see in the document that there's going to be taking that particular option, putting a 50% would be the approach which would rest with the historical allocation. The other 50% would be with some other type of allocation um, to me, that's a pretty big departure, and I just I don't mind that departure as long as the documentation is separated. That there, are, that is not really something that was introduced for that purpose. It was introduced so that there could be a stepping stone to reallocation that would be a little more moderate. Um, you know, and I my my supposition early on based on Nicola's question was that, yes, three million pounds is something that would prove to be a pretty good trigger point. Um, if we come back after the next assessment and the assessment after that, and this resource is showing that five million, six million pound quotas are available, well then yes, the board can come back, uh, the board and the council can get together and say, well, you know what, um, we really do have something that we can rely on here. 
but in the mean point, uh, in the meantime, to put in the soft trigger um, does mute the effect of putting in that um, option. And so I would request that as this goes further, that that be set aside and not included as part of the trigger point option. It may be included, however, the PDT wishes to characterize it, but clearly um, it's confounding. And, and I just want to make that statement uh, for the record. So thank you. Thank you. Caitlin, do you want to respond to that? Sure. I just want to say understood. And if the board didn't want that option in there at all, that's also your prerogative. I think right now I'm looking for some direction on which of the things the PDT put forward um, as additional ideas you guys are interested in moving forward versus not interested in moving forward. So that's helpful feedback, Rob. And I think if that stays in based on the rest of the board's um, will, we can definitely separate it out as a different kind of option than the trigger option. Thank you. Uh, Adam? So just continuing in that vein, the quotas that we see coming out of the next assessment as a result of the revised MRIF numbers, I'm not sure we're comparing apples to apples anymore in quotas that we have for 2022 and beyond relative to where we were in 2012, 2015, because they're going to be based on very different information. So I would request, uh, I support moving forward with further development of a trigger-based option, but I would ask the PDT to specifically look at what this means. And we now have the example of Summer Flounder to look at, where our quota for 2019 now means something very different. Even though the quota went up, it's not to say that the quota went up because suddenly the resource doubled in size. That, that's not what happened. The resource didn't change in size. Our understanding of it did. So what the m quota means today is very different relative to where we are. So I would ask for that consideration. Uh, in terms of a timeline moving forward, I am of the opinion that allocation should not be done through an addendum process. I think if you're trying to hold this meeting to a timeline today, uh, a motion to initiate a management document today is probably going to take you significantly over the time that's been allocated. Uh, so that would be your discretion where we go from there. But I would be a proponent if we're going to go through an allocation, it should be done through an amendment timeline process. Thank you for that. I'm going to take two more comments and then try to bring this to a conclusion. I, uh, I think, was it David? Did you have your hand up? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'll just follow up on Adam's point. Uh, I, I look at the whole EMRA uh, recalibration as an opportunity for us to fix problems. In other words, given the experience that we've all had on, on Summer Flander where the quota went up by 72 percent, had we had the benefit of actually taking a step back and taking some portion of that uh, quota, and I'm just using this as an example not to argue Summer Flounder at a black sea bass meeting, uh, but had we uh, taken advantage of that 72 uh, percent increase and tried to fix some of the problems uh, that some of the states around the table are, you know, have been having, particularly New York and Connecticut, uh, it was a way forward with, and a painless way forward. In other words, the states wouldn't have had to give up their basic allocations. We could have fixed the problems uh, and then figured out a, a, a way to move forward. We're going to have, uh, you know, it's, uh, at least my own understanding of where we're going to be is we're going to be in almost that exact same uh, position on black sea bass if, if things transpire the same way. So I'm more inclined to pick up the pace of this, try to pick up the pace of it, and it, so that we can take advantage of that opportunity to try to solve, particularly, you know, the situation with. Connecticut and New York on, on black sea bass is fairly intolerable. Connecticut gets 1% of the allocation, just unheard of. They've got 
1,400 square miles of area in Long Island Sound that's packed with black sea bass that did, didn't exist back in the initial timeline. But we've got the opportunity to fix that if the quota goes up. So I, I'm more inclined to accelerate this rather than slow it down. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nicola Meserve, and then we're going to have to try to bring this to a conclusion. Nicola? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, with regards to the trigger option, I think it's really important to note that the PDT said that in its original um, design, it does not respond to the problem statement. And moving forward, um, you know, I, I, I would oppose to continuing with a trigger approach that has equal shares of the quota above the trigger level. Um, what that does is distribute the extra quota to states indifferent of their geographic location along the coast. Um, it doesn't respond to the statement of the problem. So I'm much more interested in a modification to the trigger approach as provided by, by the PDT that would include the uh, regional resource availability and how the quota above the trigger level is distributed. Duly noted. I think that would be good guidance that we'll uh, be able to draw upon. Um, I, at this point, what I want to do is try to bring this portion of the uh, meeting, or this agenda item, to the to a conclusion. One way to do that is to entertain a motion to initiate a management action. If anyone feels a burning desire to do that, I'll, I'll entertain it. Another way forward is to just pause. You know, hit that pause button as we sometimes do. Um, we have another, our next meeting is on August. We could take the, uh, the guidance uh, provided today on all the issues that we discussed, work to further massage and develop the document, bring it back in, in August, see where we are, see if there's, uh, you know, maybe drill down a little bit more to some of these issues we discussed today. So that's a second option. Is there any preference on the part of any board member to move forward with one versus the other? And, and I'll take that in the form of, is there anyone who wishes to make a motion re, uh, pertaining to initiating a management action today? Seeing no hands, I'll assume there's consensus on the second approach that I just mentioned. And I think with that, we don't, do we need anything else today? Or to Caitlin, what, what else do you need today? I think if we're, if you're going this route of continuing PDT work on developing management options that could be considered in August, then the PDT would definitely need some more direction from you all on which of those options to include. I've obviously heard that you would prefer to scratch the ASQ option so they won't look at that anymore. Um, but with the TMGC and trigger approach, they've put forward several examples. Um, so it would be very helpful to know which of those you're interested in. Are there other examples that you would like to see of how those two options could be configured? Um, I heard Nicola say to keep looking at a modification that would take into account regional biomass information. But are there other things that the PDT could do from now until August to bring back to the board? It's a good question. It's a question asked three minutes uh, following what was supposed to be the end of this meeting. So I'm, I'm, I wish we had more time to delve into that. I'm not sure that we do. But if anyone has any immediate thoughts, I, I really in a, uh, want to honor Caitlin's request. On the other hand, I'm not sure we have enough time to really get into a, um, a parse. Well, Emailing is fine. So uh, the problem with emailing is it doesn't necessarily represent the consensus view of the board. It represents individual interests. That said, there's no harm done, given where we are in the process, to uh, open the door to individual suggestions from individual board members provided to Caitlin via email. Any of those, uh, any such input will be vetted at our August meeting. So we're not going to move forward in any new direction or any particular direction um, based on any individual board members' wishes, but it would, but it's invited and it will be uh, conveyed to the PDT if anyone wishes to weigh in. I don't know how else I can handle this at this point given where we are uh, with regard to timing, but if anyone, any board member has a different take on how best to proceed, I'm open. Otherwise, I want to try to move on to our last agenda item. Matt, it looks like you had a thought. Did you want to offer something? I just had one suggestion for Caitlin, but I don't know if I, I can handle it in an email if you like. Yeah, why don't we do that? Why don't we live live up to that suggestion that we'll uh, email uh, input is, is uh, open, uh, the door is open to that, Rob? 
I'll be very brief. So the trigger point option uh, we saw what the AP thought. So three AP members thought go forward, six thought it can go forward, give it some idea. I think what I am objecting to is the open-endedness that I saw in the document. So if the PDT wants to refine that and take in consideration uh, the resource, then that's fine, but there has to be some decisions on how that goes in time. So for example, the current trigger option that came out of the Summer Flounder Commercial Amendment, it is cut and dried. You reach a certain point, allocation changes. So the PDT can change the allocations, not make, make them even-handed to the states. That's fine. That's a different option, and that's fine. And then there has to be a decision on how much so there has to be some information on how much of the range, not just throw out 50 percent and say, well, here's some examples of 50 percent. So it has to be worked up with data. Unfortunately, when we went through the Summer Flounder Commercial Amendment, I don't think a lot of the states at the time had everything worked out as to how that actually changed allocation and what amount of poundage was transferred through the trigger point option, for example. So that's my recommendation. I'll put it in email as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. Tony? So I guess I'm, you know, Rob just gave one piece of a question for the PDT. And in that, though, I, you know, the PDT isn't making these management decisions. You all are making those management decisions, and then they are working up those examples for you. And so the PDT really needs advice on what more do you want from them outside of what they have here. I don't based on the discussion today, I'm not really sure they're going to provide you anything different than what you have here today unless you say, you know, I want a TMGC approach with no more than X percent, you know, 1 percent movement per year and a trigger here. Like, that's what they need from you all in order to bring you a document. Um, or you can say we want a range of these pieces, but they can't make those management decisions. That's what this body is here to do. Um, they've built the, the program for you, and I think they did an excellent job with this document to provide you all with some really good um, background and backbone to then turn into a document, but they need that advice back. So I, I'm just not sure they're going to give you much anything new from what they already have, so I just hope that there's not this big expectation that you're going to get much of a different document. I think that's a fair comment. I, I think that seems to be where we are, which is, uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. Um, and again, I'm trying to wrap up, but I see Adam's hand up, and I realize I didn't go to the audience, so Arnold, I will allow you to uh, offer a comment, but go ahead, Adam. So taking those comments to heart, I would propose we leave here with a date, May 15th maybe? <laughs> of anyone who wants to provide specific things they want to see or comments on the variations to get back to staff. This is what we'd like the PDT to do for us. You could give that to them. You could distribute it if you felt so inclined to the entirety of the board so they knew what everybody was doing. That might be a way forward where we are given the time frame today and hopefully get something back then for our next meeting. All right, so here's how we're going to resolve it. I'm going to take Adam up on his suggestion, but it's with a caveat, and that is by May 15th, we will, uh, with staff, I will review any and all input provided. If I think that input is, um, you know, veers off from what I would consider to be um, a direction that, that the board as a whole would support, I'm going to... I'm going to really hit the pause button and wait till we reconvene in August because I do not want to see the PDT engaging in analysis on uh, options and alternatives that may be of interest to a particular board member but not, might not be shared by the board as a whole. So I'll make that judgment call as to whether the input provided by May 15th, based on this meeting and any additional input uh, provided by May 15th, warrants continued work by the PDT. I'll, do, I'll consult with staff, obviously, and, and with my vice chair. And We'll try and make that determination. I, I will be very vigilant 
on behalf of the board to make sure that we don't put too much time and effort into any new ideas or options that haven't been sort of cleared by the board. And with that, we may end up not making a whole lot more progress until August, but we will, I will challenge you to be ready in August to kind of uh, get a little bit more um, uh, concrete in, in, in our direction forward. But I think, you know, this is a process of the ball moving forward. I think we have moved the ball forward today, and I appreciate that, and I'm, I'm ready to wind it up. But Arnold, I'll give you this opportunity to, to uh, comment. And while he's coming up, uh, Tina, if you're not already ready, I'm going to be calling on Tina next for the AP uh, membership issue. Go ahead, Arnold. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks. Um, a, a recommendation um, to include in the possible addendum um, has occurred to me that uh, when it comes to these questions of allocation among uh, the states or the user groups, uh, it, they're always stalled because obviously the states or user groups who are going to lose will oppose change and those who might gain will be in favor of change. So we we're constantly stalled at making any progress. So I wonder if it's not time to consider the appointment of a wholly independent body, say consisting of three marine scientists from like Iceland, England, and Portugal who don't have a dog in this fight to consider the allocation questions and make the decision that obviously um, is a torturous pro process for the uh, commission to make uh, the way it's presently set up. So that would be my suggestion for uh, um, a, an item to be included. Thanks. Thank you. Any other input from the public on this matter? Seeing none, we'll, uh, we'll move on to um, our next agenda item, which is to review and populate AP membership. Is Tina Berg there? Tina, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I offer for your uh, consideration and approval the uh, nomination of Paul Caruso, a recreational angler from Massachusetts, as a addition to the Summer Flanders Cup and Black Sea Bass AP. Thank you. Is there a, a motion to approve the appointment of Paul Caruso made by Nicola Meserve, seconded by Emerson Hasbrook? Is there any objection to the motion? Seeing no objection, Paul is appointed. Thank you, and we welcome Paul to the AP. Um, under other business, I just want to briefly uh, speak to an issue that I had referred to earlier. For our next board meeting in August, I am anticipating that there will be a report out on the status of the ongoing preliminary work being done by the Recreational Working Group regarding management reform. Uh, that effort being undertaken initially by a relative small group involving myself and Adam Nowalski as well as Caitlin and Tony, Mike Luisi and Rob O'Reilly on behalf of the Mid-Atlantic Council along with staff from the Mid-Atlantic Council uh, and, and as well staff from GARFO is seeking to frame a set of priority issues associated with recreational management, particularly the desire to achieve more interannual stability that is obviating or at least lessening the need to engage in our annual process of chasing the RHL. As part of that effort, or as a corollary to that effort, I'd like to engage in a uh, long overdue discussion on reducing discard mortality in our recreational fisheries, particularly black sea bass, but perhaps summer flounder as well. My good friend and colleague Ray Kane, who I thought was here um, but may have left, um, from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, has been pushing for consideration of this issue, backed by the results of a couple of recent studies. We've been so inundated with issues over the past year, um, and as a result, this issue have, of discard mortality has unfortunately gotten pushed back in time, uh, or in line time and again. But I think the time is is, is a good one now to bring this uh, to the fore at our next meeting in August. So I'm therefore proposing we do that. If there are no objections to the idea, I will work with staff to ensure that we get that teed up and invite all board members to contact uh, us if you have any specific ideas related to the project. Again, this is picking up on a, uh, an issue that has been um, recommended to me by one board member uh, repeatedly, and I just want to honor that request by uh, acknowledging that it will be folded into our August meeting. With that, is there any other business to be brought before the board? Seeing no hands, is there any objection to adjourning? Seeing no objection, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. We will